One of the scariest days of my life as a parent was the day that my oldest daughter discovered a new word. And this word, she said for the very first time, as I was getting her ready for school in the morning. And I was getting her ready for school one day. She was eating breakfast, but she was not eating breakfast as quickly as I would have liked. She was taking her sweet old time. And I was in a hurry because I wanted to get her to school that day. And so I said, Lola, you need to eat your breakfast. And she turned around and she looked at me and she said, okay, daddy, but why? It was a very scary day for me. And she had never asked me that question before, so I didn't really know how to respond to it. Well, I said, Lola, you need to eat your breakfast because you don't want to be hungry when you go to school. And she said, why? And I said, well, if you go to school and you're hungry, you're not going to be able to focus on what your teachers are teaching you, and it's really important that you learn what they're trying to tell you. And she said, why? (laughs) And I said, well, um, you know, you need to learn the subjects and learn school and study and, you know, learn stuff so that, like, you know, you can get a good education and you can, you know, get a good education. It's important. Why? Well, because if you get a good education and you learn all the things that you need to learn, then you can be effective in whatever area that God moves you into. Why? And it was at that moment that I turned around and I said, Lola, I do not negotiate with terrorists. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I didn't say that, but I felt like it. But it is in that moment I realized why when I was a kid, a lot of times my parents told me, because I said so. <laughs> that mo- <laughs> my daughter learned a new word and I learned a new saying that day. Because I said so. End of conversation. And it's... <laughs> but it's funny because, um, you know, my daughter is four, right? So, I mean, she's a child. And to her defense, she doesn't know. She doesn't know why she needs to eat breakfast. She doesn't know why she needs to go to school. So it's my job as a parent to help her to understand that. But it got me thinking about when I was a child spiritually. I never, you know, grew up going to church every week, and I remember I walked into church, and people were like, oh, you know, we gather as a church, and we sing songs to Jesus. What? (laughs) Is that Leo? You always got my back, Leo. Why? Well, because, you know, that's what we do. We, We worship Jesus. Why? Well, because Jesus is worthy. Why? Why is Jesus worthy? Well, because Jesus is God and he, you know, d- lived in real life and died. It, it, and again, someone who walks in with, I, I think as Christians, we struggle to articulate this stuff, especially to a lot of people who are new in their faith, right? And they come in and they're wondering, why? Why? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And it's important that we're able to bring people along the journey. And I remember when I first walked into church and I, I met a group of Christians and they said, hey, I, um, I, I, hear, I heard from God this week. And I was like, you What? They're like, yeah, yeah, I was praying this, and God spoke to me. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. God spoke to you. Like, what did he say? What does God sound like? And they were like, well, I don't know. It's not like an audible voice, but I, I prayed, and I, he, he, he spoke to me. I kind of know in other ways. I'm like, what do you mean God speaks to you? Like, that's amazing. What does God say? And they're like, I don't, stuff. He says stuff to me, you know? And, um, and I, I was like, okay, um, can I make you a deal? You hear from God, and I don't. So can I ask you a question, and can you ask God? And whatever he gives you as an answer, can you tell me what he says? Because I really want to know what God has to say about this. And then they explained to me it doesn't quite work like that. And uh, I was a little bit confused. But I literally thought Christians had like an earpiece from God. And they would walk around, and God would just speak to them 24-7, like turn 45 degrees left. Great, walk over here. You know, do this, don't do this. And when I first walked into church, I kid you not, I actually thought Christians were perfect. Because if Christians heard from God, and somebody was doing something that was heading in a direction that was not something God wanted them to do, obviously God would speak to them because they hear from God, and they would adjust accordingly. And so I came into church, and for a little bit, I thought Christians were perfect because they hear from God. How many of you know it didn't take me too long to realize (laughs) that Christians, it didn't take me long at all to realize that Christians are not perfect. Christians are not perfect. You know, last week we talked about revival. And revival is amazing. We talked about the Korean revival where 40% of the nation came to faith in Jesus. We talked about the Welsh revival, 100,000 people coming to faith in Jesus. It's amazing. I think revival is awesome. I think what God was doing at Asbury is amazing. 
But the problem with revival is that it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's not like a single moment, but it, it's a fixed time frame when a revival happens. And you can have a revival, but ultimately you're reviving Jesus' church. So after the revival has kind of started and ended, then you have the church needs to continue forward. And so today we're going to talk about the church. And the problem with Jesus' church is that Jesus is perfect, but his church isn't. Jesus is holy. He is perfect. He will never let you down. Christians are not perfect. Not fully holy. We're trying to be more holy. Christians will let you down. Things will happen. And we need to be able to navigate this. And the church is not perfect. I I obviously, I've said that before. But I also think we need to be very careful how we talk about Jesus' church. We need to be very careful how we talk about Jesus' church. I see David and Rachel in the back. Give us a wave, David and Rachel. So you guys are married. Right? Okay. You were yesterday when I checked. Um, so um, so I, first of all, I love David. But imagine if, let's rewind back to their wedding day. If David was on his way to the wedding, and on the way I stopped him, and I said, hey, and I'm going to say this about Rachel because I love Rachel. She knows that I'm using this as an illustration only, right? Tracking with me, Rachel? Okay, cool. So um, on the way to the wedding, I stopped David, and I said, hey, David, um, hey, man, before you, know, before you, you go to Rachel, I just got to let you know, man, Rachel is terrible. Like, she's horrible. She's mean. She's nasty. She sucks. Gosh, she's, she's just annoying. I can't stand Rachel. And matter of fact, I don't ever want to see her again. I don't want anything to do with her. I don't want to see her ever again. How many of you know David's in my relationship would not be on the same level as it was before? And I think a lot of the times we come into church and we know that Jesus' church is not perfect. But Jesus is coming back for his church. And so when we only complain about Jesus' church, well, Christians should do this, Christians should do that, you know, oh, it should be more like this, should be more like that. Um, what we're doing is we're actually complaining about Jesus' bride. There's a big difference between a problem finder and a problem solver. A problem finder sees all the issues. This is wrong. That's not good. This could be better. This is not what it could be. That's messed up. A problem finder is a little bit like a commentator that commentates on a sports game. Steph Curry shouldn't have shot that three-pointer. It's cool. From the comfort of your seat on the side of the court. Your opinion is awesome, right? It's like commentating. We're commenting on the game, but we're not actually in the game. A problem finder comments on what other people are doing. A problem solver gets in the game and actually plays a part in trying to help orchestrate the outcome. Just because you think Justin Fields should not have thrown that pass from the comfort of your sofa, doesn't mean that you could be a better quarterback than Justin Fields. We're not going to talk about the Bears too much because we'll all get depressed. But just because Justin Fields shouldn't have thrown that pass and you can see that there was a problem with it doesn't mean that you're a better quarterback than he is. Justin Fields is a better quarterback than any of us, right? He's amazing. So we can look and we can find fault or we can decide that we're going to get in the game. And it is not our role to complain about Jesus' bride. It is our job to get Jesus' bride ready for when he comes back. It is our job to be problem solvers, not problem finders. So the title of this message today is A House That Looks Like Heaven. We're going to look at Ephesians, which is actually the verse that Juliet used in the offering moment. But we're going to read it first in the ESV, and then we're going to read it in the message. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You and I are being built into a house. It's not a physical house, it's a spiritual house. And we're being built into a spiritual house where God's presence dwells. The message puts it this way. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. The kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer stranger, or uh, you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. 
God is building a home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us being built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. Jesus is building his church, but he's using you to do it. He's using you to play a part in it. He's actually building us into a spiritual house. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of God using us and building us into a spiritual house where his presence is tangible, where God shows up, where God is there, because we are built into a temple the way that God has designed it. Anybody ever heard of the Great Commission? You know what commission means? Co-mission. Co is in together and mission. That means that you and I are on a co-mission together with God. God has a part to play and we have a part to play. And I think way too many Christians today sit around and abdicate their part to play and then blame God that God didn't do what they thought he was going to do. It's your and I's job to take care of what God has entrusted to us and then ultimately it's God's job to take care of what has been entrusted to him. So today we're going to talk about how to build God's house. How you and I together can become a spiritual house and the kind of house where God's presence is thick. It's tangible. God is welcome. God is moving freely. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to look at Exodus, the tabernacle. So we're going to go to Exodus 25. And the first way to build God's house is to, first and foremost, follow God's instructions. Exodus 25 says, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle in all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Make it how I show you. If you are going to build God's house, you have to do it his way. You have to do it his way. I think oftentimes we as Christians overcomplicate the Bible. I love commentaries. I love lexicons. I love getting into the Greek and the Hebrew and the word studies and all that stuff. But there's something in the business world we call paralysis by analysis. And that's when there's a, something happening and you get so into the analysis of it that you actually don't take action on anything. And I think oftentimes we do that as Christians. Where the Bible says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Well, I mean, what does love mean? You know, there's four different Greek words for love and let's really study them and you know, uh, your enemy, I mean, what, what really is an enemy? I mean, who even knows what an enemy is? You know, and there's this person that I can't stand, but I mean, they, they might not be my enemy. I mean, the, the Greek word for this means this. And we kind of like philosophize and we make it overly academic. And I think oftentimes we miss out. James says this, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. So if you and I sit around and we debate the Bible and we talk about it, we talk about the theoretical concepts of this and that, and we don't actually apply it to our life, we are missing out. We're trying to build God's church and we're not doing it according to his design. Anybody ever seen a movie where they are dissecting a, a dead body? Maybe it's like a morgue, you know, someone's died, or maybe it's a crime scene, someone's lying there, and there's like, you know, cops like smoking cigarettes, laughing, joking, oh, what are you doing tonight, uh, you know, there's like, like literally a dead body just lying on the ground. Right? But the body's already dead, so there's no sense of, of reverence because it's dead. But if you, co if you contrast that with a movie where there's a medical team performing open heart surgery, there's an entire team standing around. It's quiet. There's weight. There's focus. Everyone's on edge, like what's going to happen next? It's really, really important what they're doing. And I think way too many people approach the Bible like it's a dead body. Well, you know, this verse is great, and let's cut this apart. Oh, let's dissect that a little bit. This is great. Hey, what are you doing for dinner tonight? You know, hey, you know, this is great. A and you and I were never meant to treat the Bible like it's a dead body. Right. The Word of God is alive, and it is active, and it is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it divides joints and marrow, soul and spirit. When you and I open the Word of God, we were meant to treat it like it's alive because it is. It is the Word of God, so we open it with reverence and awe, and we read it. And what it tells us to do, we go and do it. That's how we were created. 
We don't live in a morgue. We don't live in a surgery center either, but you get what I'm saying. So just a few different examples. This is not exhaustive, but a few different ways that God has actually outlined and entrusted us to say, build my church like this. A few examples. The first is gather together. Matthew 18, 20 says, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. If you and I get together and we gather under the name of Jesus, he shows up. Not just God's omnipresence, but his manifest presence. And I know that, you know, we went through a couple years where we kind of got out of gathering together, but there's way too many Christians that are like, oh, I'm going to be a free agent. I'm not going to gather together with the church. I'm just kind of going to do my own thing. And the Bible describes this as the body of Christ. And when we do that, it's like an amputated finger lying on the other side of the room. It's not going to last long. You and I were created to be in community, a part of the body of Christ. Church is not something we do. The church is who we are. And you and I were meant to gather together, not just once a week on Sundays. That's why we have community groups that meet throughout the week, but not just on Sundays in the community groups. The early believers gathered daily in the temple courts. Nothing gets me more excited than when I see people in our church hanging out. Went out to a fun dinner on Monday. Cool. Great. Not a formal church event. Not a formal church gathering. Still two or three gathered together in my name. So you and I were meant to be a part of gathering together to worship Jesus in community, but also doing life with people one-to-one and in groups. We, we're, we're meant to do this together, to walk this out. Exactly. Yeah. In the last two years, two, three years, we've gotten out of a rhythm. We need to get back into it. Go into the gym once a month, not going to help you that much. Go in every day. Who's going to work out once a month and who's going to work out every day for the next three months? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to. So the other thing is to stay planted. Psalm 92 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Are you planted? You and I live in a day and age of cancel culture. If you do one thing I don't like, I'm going to cancel you. You say, one thing that makes me uncomfortable, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm gone. And the problem when we move around so much is that we never grow roots that are deep. You know that God wants to use you to do things in his name. But you and I can only go as high up as we have depth of roots to be able to sustain it. And so when you and I get offended and move and this and that, and I'm kind of part of this church and that church and this church and that church, and you're not really fully planted anywhere what that does is it means that you don't grow deep roots. And you're not going to be able to, to sustain what God wants to do in your life. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Another one, forgive others. Therefore, if you are offering a gift on the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there and, uh, in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come back and offer your gift. Forgive others. Jules and I have been doing this long enough to know when we meet people we, um, who come in and they're like, well, you know, I, you know, I kind of got offended at my old church and, you know, I had some problems there and had problems here and problems there. I actually had a call with a guy um, a while back and he's like, hey, you know, my old church uh, was terrible and the pastors were not nice to me and these people did this and these people did that and the church before that was awful and they did this and they did that and they did this and the church before that was terrible and oh my gosh, they sucked and it was horrible and the church before that was horrific and, oh, but your church looks great. I think I'm going to come here. And I said, don't do it. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, why? Why? And I said, because we're going to suck. You're going to be part of this for church for three months. And someone's going to say something you don't like. Or someone's going to be annoying. Or someone's going to encourage you in a way and you maybe misunderstand it or whatever. Something's going to happen and you're going to get offended. And when we get offended and we leave and we run away, the offense goes with us. And so I told this guy, I said, hey, I'm not saying you can't come to our church. I'm not going to ban you from coming, obviously. But if I were you, I would turn right around. I would go back to your old church. I would have the conversation that you need to happen there. I would deal with whatever offense is happening right now. Because if you don't do that, you are not going to be free. This is going to come with you everywhere you go. Wherever you go. There you are. 
Are we going to forgive others? Are we going to deal with the things that we need to deal with so that we can move forward? If you're going to build God's house, you have to do it his way. God's not, interesting. God's not interested in building the house, just building the house that you want. Well, I want God to do this for me and do that for me and this for me and that for me and bless me and do this for me and that for me. Cool, God, God loves you. God wants to bless you. But the Bible says that we are to put him first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all those other things are going to be added to you. But if you do not have Jesus Christ first in your life, everything, everything else is going to be out of order. The second way is to steward God's presence. Exodus 40 says this, In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day. The fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So the glory of the Lord comes in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Pretty cool. You know that they were not responsible for making God show up, but they were responsible for stewarding God's presence. If it stays here, you stay with it. If it moves, you better get moving with it. And how many of you know that following Jesus is not convenient? Could you imagine it's midnight, you're tired, you're about to go to bed, God starts moving this way. Everyone's like, hey, everyone, wake up. We're rolling out. It's not convenient. Following God is not convenient. And we live in a day and age where um, there's different words to describe it, but one is comfortable Christianity or consumer Christianity. And that's like, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And yeah, I mean, if God will help me get what I want, then yeah, I'll have God in, as a piece of my life because God will help me get what I want. It's consumer Christianity and it will not work. God was not designed to be a part of your life. He was meant to be first in your life. And so we need to reframe our view. It's not, is God for you? Yes, of course he is. It's, are you for God? Are you going to put God first in your life? God entrusts his presence to those who are faithful. We talked about the Asbury Revival, and you had all these college students worshiping 24 hours a day for a few days, and then all of a sudden more people heard about it. 50,000 people came to the area. And a lot of these students went from being a part of the worship night, uh, worship days, worship nights, and they started to serve other people who were coming. And there were kids who would get there at 6 a.m. and not leave until midnight. They were trying to steward what God was doing. And you and I cannot manufacture what God's doing, but we were meant to steward it. And when we steward what God's doing, it, it actually costs us something. It's inconvenient. The third way is to advance God's mission. Exodus 35 says this, Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, and son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. And he has filled them with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. So you have Moses who's constructing the tabernacle, and he's not just doing it all himself. He's actually empowering other people to do it. I wonder who in your life has the Lord chosen? Who do you look around and you're like, you know what? God has this on their life. God has that on their life. I think so often we live our life, we go around and it's all about me, 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 me. But God actually wants you to, to reverse that and not live your life for yourself, but to actually sacrifice your life to live for others. To look at other people and say, how can I bless you? How can I help you? It's the way that God designed us to live. Matthew 28 says it this way, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has given us a mandate to make disciples of Jesus. To make apprentices of God. I don't know about you, but I want to get to the end of my life and say, I gave everything I had pouring into other people. I gave everything I had to help other people step into a relationship with God. To get freedom in their life. To figure out what God's asking them to do, and to ultimately help and support them as they do it. And that's exactly what Moses does here. If you build God's house his way, God will show up. How many of you want to be a part of a church where God shows up? Where God's presence is tangible. It's manifest. 
Exodus 40 says, Then the clouds covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of a church where the glory of the Lord fills the church. Fills the church. Where you and I can't even like see straight because the presence of God is so thick and it is so tangible. I used the example of uh, David and Rachel earlier. Thank you guys for being good sports. I'm going to go way more right now. Just kidding. So um, if I were to reuse that example where I go to David and I'm like, hey, I don't like your wife and she's this and she's that, you know, and I'm taking shots. Instead of doing that, what God has actually asked us to do is for me to actually go to Rachel and say, hey, how can I help you? What can I do to help you get ready? What can I do to help set you up for a win? Oh, you need something from here? Great, I'll go get it for you. Like, it's our job not to rip on Jesus' bride, but to actually help get her ready. You and I were not created to be problem finders. We were created to be problem solvers. And so I want to encourage you to get in the game. So many incredible people, so many incredible team in this church that are in the game, that are doing incredible things. But we talked about last week that God is pouring out his spirit. He's doing something new really, really special in our midst, even when you had to wake up an hour early to be here today. God is doing something incredible, not just here, but all across the earth. But you and I need to make sure that Jesus' bride is ready. Otherwise, people who don't know Jesus are going to walk into this place and something's going to be missing. The bride's not going to be ready for them. We need to get it ready for those who are not yet here, and we also need to get it ready for Jesus who is coming back. A lot of people want to be a part of a church where worship is amazing and awesome, but the question is, are we going to show up ready to worship? A lot of people want to be a part of a church with powerful prayer, but the question is, did you come ready to pray? Did you come ready to add your faith to what God is doing? There's a whole lot of people that want good friends. And I just want to say as a side note, people don't want a friendly church, people want friends. My hope and my prayer for this church is not that people walk in and they go, oh, people said hi to me and they were nice to me and it was cool. My hope is that people walk into this place and they go, oh my gosh, three people swapped numbers with me today. I've got a coffee, a lunch, and a dinner this week. People don't want a friendly church. They want friends. But I want to encourage you that if you're like, hey, I want more friends, don't wait for someone else to come be friendly to you. You step out and go be friendly to someone else. Don't just want better friends. Be a better friend. Don't just want more people in your life. Step out and invite more people into your life. Jules and I meet a lot of people that walk in and they're like, oh my gosh, this is the friendliest church ever. I met so many people, it's amazing. And we've also met people who kind of walked in, hid from everybody, hid in the back, ran out, you know, before the service even ended. And they're like, oh, I wasn't really that friendly. I I don't know, you (laughs) kind of look like you were hiding, right? If you want better friends, you got to step out and be a better friend. A lot of people want a great kids ministry. A whole lot fewer people want to serve in the kids' ministry. You get what I'm saying? Jesus builds his church, but he uses you and I to do it. And so you and I have a mandate and a responsibility to build the church, to co-build it together with God, to build the church that you and I want to have, that you and I want to be a part of, where God's presence is thick and tangible and it dwells. We can do a song. So I just want to ask, this is a little bit more of a housekeeping message today. Last week we talked about revival. Revival is great, but it happens for a a time. After the revival is over, then what? Then what's going to happen? And we need to get Jesus' church ready. There are people in in this city that need this church, that need churches all over this area. And we need so many more believers to get in the game and say, I'm going to be a part of helping get Jesus' church ready for them and ready for him. So what's your next step? Maybe if you're like here for the first time, maybe it's just to come back next week ready. Come back expectant. Don't walk into, you know, worship 10 minutes late and be like, oh, I wish I had a coffee. I'm so tired. Like, get here five minutes early. Be ready. When worship starts, you take it where it needs to go. The worship team is not on this platform. The worship team is out here. We're all a part of the worship team. Even if your voice is as bad as mine. Maybe it's after the service, meet somebody. 
and say, hey, do you want to hang out this week? Doesn't sound super spiritual, does it? It actually is. You and I were meant to share our life with others. Who are you inviting into your life? Maybe it's to stop complaining about something and to actually go be a part of the solution, to go and help fix it. Maybe it's to join a team to jump in and get involved. You may have noticed, but the, the room is starting to fill up a little bit. We're going to have to move to two services. We're definitely doing two services for Easter, but we're going to have to move to two services here pretty quick. And that sounds great, but that means that in order to have it happen, we can't do it just with the team that we have. There's been a few kind of key moments in our church, like right after launch date, God brought a whole bunch of new people. I don't know how, but they did. And then end of last year, all of a sudden, you know, 30 people joined team within like a month. It was insane. Nothing that we did. God just brought 30 people that joined team. And then for whatever reason, the last three weeks, God's just brought a whole bunch more people. And if, you're, if you've been coming around for a month, I want to encourage you, jump in, get involved on team. Because there's people that are coming next month and the month after who need you to help prepare this place to be ready for them. Maybe it's just to find one person and pour your life into them. To make a disciple, to pour your life into them. We're going to sing one more song, and then I'm going to come out and pray for one more group of people. I just want you. There's one more group of people that I want to pray for in here, and that is um, those of you here today who are not in a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe at one point in your life you were walking with God, but if you're honest with yourself, you've kind of veered off track. You've, you've walked away from him. And today you want to come back to him today. You want to make a fresh dedication of your life to Jesus. You and I were created to be in a relationship with God. And the Bible tells us that no one can come to him unless God draws them. For whatever reason in this season, God is drawing people to himself. We talked about last week that a revival is an intensification of the normal operations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always does what he does, but in a time of revival, it, it's more intense. The intensity cranks up. And for whatever reason, Julia and I have met so many people in this church in the last few weeks that God is drawing. And I'm here today to ask you, is God drawing you? Is God drawing you back into a relationship with him? And if you do not know Jesus, I would love to give you the opportunity to make that decision. Decision I made many years ago. It's the best decision I've ever made. And I would love to give you that opportunity. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, I want a relationship with Jesus, God's drawing me to him. I don't really 100% understand what's happening, but I want to know him. I want to put him first in my life. This is your moment. Or if at one point in your life you made that decision and you've wandered off, sort of run away from God, today you can come back to him today. He's standing with his arms wide open, waiting for you to come back to him. If that's you, on the count of three, give me a wave. And hold your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. No one else is looking around. There's a private moment between you and God. But I'd love to know who I'm praying for. So on the count of three, give me a wave. One, Jesus loves you. He died and rose again so you could have life. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't miss this moment. Three, give me a wave if that's you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Anybody else? You want a relationship with Jesus? Thank you. I see you in the back. Anybody else? I want a relationship with Jesus today. I want to walk out differently than I came in. I don't just want to know about God. I want to know him. Amazing. Thank you. You can go ahead and look up here and put your hands down. The Bible says in Romans that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So by you putting your hand up and saying, hey, I, I want to pray that prayer, that's you believing in your heart. And now I want to help you to confess with your mouth. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you put your hand up, especially pray this, but we're all going to say this along with you because we're in this together. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I've messed up and I need your forgiveness. And today I choose to follow you. It's by your grace that I'm saved and by your power that I am set free. It is a new day in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give it again for everybody who made that decision.